this point that it's become a cliche that 2020 has been pretty rough, right? And, uh, but I do appreciate as people are going through this that they show some humor about it, they're rolling with it. I found a few memes I wanna share with you that just I could relate to. I know I started the year this way, uh, being prepared for 2020 <laughs> and then uh, doing that. Um, this one maybe you can relate to. If 2020 was a drink, what would it be? A colonoscopy prep. I've never gone through that, but I've heard friends talk about it. I have been through this though. 2020 was a bag of chips, orange juice, and toothpaste. I've had that happen before too. So we all know that 2020 been, has been rough. We got the pandemic going on. We got the resulting economic collapse uh, thing that's happening. But now we have cities that are burning. So that's that's kind of a, a thing that could be a little unsettling. And all the uh, tensions that are going on in our country from political to racial to things feel pretty unstable, right? So at the very beginning of this or near the beginning, we said, all right, what are we going to do? How can we respond like this so we can... Uh, keep our sanity and keep our perseverance. And that, that passage that you saw come up on the video that played right before I got up, I want to repeat to you. It says, and let us with, run the, with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Now, first of all, there's an acknowledgement, there's a simple acknowledgement that uh, there is a race to be run and it requires perseverance and it calls us to fix our eyes on Jesus. So if you want to get through this year or any year or any kind of circumstances that are shaky or unstable, what you want to do is fix your eyes on Jesus. There's a few things that are very important to note about that. Now, if you're a Christ-following person, it means that Christ does indwell you but at the same time, we need to remember that he's other than you. So in other words, he's on the outside of you in the sense that he's the object of discovery. What we want to do to fix your eyes on Jesus, you want to take your eyes off. There's lots of things you could look at in the world right now, a whole lot of things, too, much, too many things. But to fix your eyes on Jesus means I'm going to focus on him. I'm going to listen to what he has to say, uh, take in his values and study who he is. And that's why we've also stressed that you want to make sure that you're studying the Jesus who is presented in the Bible, Jesus as he presents himself in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So what we've done is we've just taken one of the books, the book of Luke, off the shelf, and we're just going through and we're on a voyage of discovery. And I can't stress that discovery feature enough because even though many of us, maybe we have a background and we think we know these stories. I've read a number of these stories before many, many times. But the discovery attitude is I still believe there's something I can learn and there's something I can see that I maybe hadn't seen before. I want to take that thing as I'm, I'm going on a journey to get my eyes more focused on him. Uh, one of my very favorite books in life, and this goes back 20 years, is a book called The Jesus I Never Knew. It's written by a guy named Philip Yang. And what Philip Yancey did was he decided to do this. He had been raised in church. He had gone to Bible college. And he decided, you know, maybe I don't know as much about Jesus as I should. Or maybe I'm not seeing him or thinking of him the way I really ought to be. So he read the Gospels repeatedly. He read, he went to the library and checked out as many books as he could find on the life of Jesus. He said he went back and, look, and watched every film that he could find on Jesus. He even held classes where they discussed these films and these discussion groups about the life of Jesus. And then he assimilates it all in the book called The Jesus I Never Knew. And I, I love this quote that he gives at the beginning of the book of how the whole process impacted him. He said, Jesus, I found, bore little resemblance to the Mr. Rogers figure I had met in Sunday school and was remarkably unlike the person I had studied in Bible college. For one thing, he was far less tame. In my prior image, I realized Jesus' personality matched that of a Star Trek Vulcan. He remained calm and cool and collected as he strode like a robot among excitable human beings on spaceship Earth. That is not what I found portrayed in the Gospels and in the better films. Other people affected Jesus deeply. Obstinacy frustrated him. Self-righteousness infuriated him. Simple faith thrilled him. Indeed, he seemed more emotional and spontaneous than the average person, not less. More passionate, not less. Now, you don't have to agree with Yancey one way or the other, but the point is this. He went on the discovery, and he found that he started off thinking he knew something, but he discovered that there was a lot more to learn and to grow 
And he found that Jesus was a lot different than he prior thought. And that's really the goal. And that's what we mean by fixing our eyes on Jesus. So we've been traveling through Luke. And uh, last week we ended chapter five and we're ready to go on to chapter six. But before we do that, what I wanted to do today is I wanted to tap the brake. And I wanted to stop so we could assess some of the big lessons that we've learned so far. And I'm, and I'm talking out uh, for myself. What are the things that I have learned so far that I'd really like to lock down? Things that I maybe knew before but didn't appreciate quite as deeply, or maybe I didn't know before or hadn't noticed. What have I discovered? And I want to do that for a couple of reasons. First of all, because I want to take this journey very seriously so we don't just kind of go on and study things and never lock them down. But also, I do want to share some things that I think are important to our church going forward and kind of frame those things that we're going to be doing going into the future and that I'm going to be asking all of us to do and frame it in that discovery of Jesus. So as I've gone on the discovery, here's the first thing I want to lock down that I've learned from the gospel of Luke, looking at it, studying it and doing the background and preaching on it. It's this, Jesus is presented in the gospel of Luke and elsewhere as absolutely unapologetic unapologetically and unmistakably the centerpiece of life. Let me say that again. Jesus is presented as absolutely unapologetically and unmistakably the centerpiece of life. And I could have used many more adverbs. That's one of the things that strikes me more and more. Now, now I'm sure some of you are like, well, duh, you didn't know that before? Come on, preacher man, give me something I didn't know. Well, I'm saying, of course I knew that because you're supposed to know that as a Christian person. But what I increased in was my confidence in the fact that that is the way Christianity presents itself and has presented itself from the very beginning. And that's in the Gospels, is that Jesus is, without mistake, the centerpiece of history. I've mentioned before, um, I, I, I had the opportunity in the course of my life to uh, go to Muslim countries and talk to Muslim people about the things of Jesus and all that. And one of the things I decided to do, it was important, I wanted to understand Islam. Uh, I, 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 and I didn't want to understand Islam based on rumor, based on what I'd heard on CNN or uh, what, what even other Christians said about it. I wanted to know what it actually said about itself. And so I read most of the Quran, and, and I read actually a very good book where a guy was selling. He was, he was an American person who had converted to Islam, and he was selling it heavy, saying, this is why you ought to become a Muslim. And the reason I did that was I didn't become a Muslim. As a matter of fact, I didn't agree with some of the things that I saw. But what I did do, and I felt like integrity demanded, was I wanted to know how Islam understood itself. I wanted to know the real thing. And that's what I'm saying when it comes to going in the Gospel of Luke and seeing that the early Christians, without apology and unmistakably, saw Jesus as the centerpiece of life. He's the one that all of history is anticipating. Luke kind of presents it that way. He, 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 has, he says the prophets that have gone before, they're looking for him. He is the Lord. He is the Son of Man. He is the God become man. And all of our lives are measured against him and, me and measured by him. That is unmistakably what Christianity stands on and rises and falls on. It's always been that way from the very, very beginning. And so we don't have to apologize for that because I, Christians get made fun of a little bit for this uh, in, in popular culture. Like, they're always talking about Jesus, you know, come to Jesus. And we, and we want to have discussions about Jesus. And I've always found that everybody out there pretty much admires Jesus, but no one really is comfortable talking about him. But actual, real, original Christianity definitely did not apologize one bit for being centered on Jesus and saying that he was the centerpiece of life. And I think we need to be reminded of that. It's very, very important. There's a, there's a passage later on in the New Testament in a book called 1 John. It's an epistle. And um, he, he writes in a very plain language, a very blunt language. And listen to what he says. He was one of Jesus' immediate followers. He says, who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist. Denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledged the Son has the Father also. Pretty blunt. Whoever denies that Jesus is, uh, is not the Christ is a liar. Got any questions? Then he goes on a, little, a couple of chapters later and he says it this way. Listen to this. Whoever has the Son has life. 
whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Now that just kind of lays it right out there, right? If you don't have Jesus, you don't have life. If you do have Jesus, you do. Okay, that, that's, it, that's it. And that's the way they thought, and, that's, and they, they didn't apologize for that. Now, if you're an explorer, here's what you're faced with, the same thing I was when it came to Islam. You need to know that that's really how it is presented. That's what Christianity is. It centers around the person of Jesus. Now, that doesn't require that you agree with it. I just want you to know that that is the thing itself. And what we invite you to do and what we want to do is provide an environment where you can ask questions about that and your, your, your intellectual objections can be dealt with and we can dialogue and you can challenge it or whatever else. But the most important thing is you need to know that that is how it presents itself. And if it's true, your life is measured against and by Jesus. It is. Now, if it's not true, we all ought to just kind of let it go and say, okay, that was a nice little myth and go about our way. But if it is true, and think about this, those of us who call ourselves Christ followers, if that's really true, that he is truly the centerpiece of all existence, of all of life, and that if you have him, you have life, and if you do not him, have him, you do not have life. If that is a fact, if that's reality, what could possibly be more important and then devoting ourselves to communicating that message, to discussing those things with people, to announcing those things, and getting that message out, because nothing could be more important, right? What could possibly be more important than that? And that's what we decided to do. When we set out 10 years ago, we said, okay, we want to help people who are far from God to trust and follow Jesus. And we're as, uh, assembling all of our resources, giving our talent, giving our time, giving our passions, giving our prayers, getting involved in this, building buildings, uh, doing broadcasting. We're doing all this stuff for that single purpose. And when you recognize that, it's perfectly logical. Because if it's true that he really is who the Bible claims him to be, it's absolutely logical to give your life to that end. And that's vital. Here's why. Um, we, we're we're kind of going through some changes, obviously, in the light of 2020. It's been kind of a drag, and it's, it, we've kind of adjusted ourselves. And... and, and uh, in the face of it, things changed a lot, and, and uh, we made plans, and they got canceled, and then we made plans out of those plans, and those plans got canceled, and then we made some other plans that got canceled, and we keep doing that, and I know that's going on in businesses and schools and everything else. But the challenge is, it's been easy, and of course, during the summer, too, and I've gone on vacation, and I hope you got to go on vacation. If you haven't, I hope you get to go on one. We need to rest, and things are kind of spreading out. But I think what's happened, and I know in my own heart, because of all the stuff going on, just trying to not make a plan that doesn't get canceled, the challenge of it, it kind of waters down the essence of what life is really all about. He who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son does not have life. And if I really believe that, and that's an actual fact, I need to kind of get some smelling salts and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm, I'm involved in the most important mission there is, period. And that's not to say that other things that we do in life, whether it's our work or whatever else, all of them is in as much as they lead to that ultimate effort, as much as they're centered on who Christ is, that all matters and all has value. But when it comes to this front thing that we say we want to help people far from God, trust and follow Jesus, that's what we need to all give ourselves to. So what we decided to do is, all right, okay, now that we're kind of rested up and we're trying to assess all this, we've got a problem. We, we do have people who are scattered out. And I completely understand that some people are not going to be able to come back into the building. Some people for the foreseeable future, we don't know because they're in high risk categories or they're close to someone in high risk categories. And so our attendance is down and some of our volunteers aren't able to make it and all those kinds of things. So we decided, okay, right now what we're doing is in, in just in the adult world, and I hope you heard my update that we sent out about kids' ministry, but I want to talk to you about the adult world right now. Uh, we've been having teams just kind of patchwork together, providing four different ex worship experiences, our internet and our three campuses. And they've done their best, and they're trying to, and, and it hasn't been bad by any stretch. But at the same time, it's not been at that level of excellence and passion that we've experienced in the past because we're all together and we're working a mission. Because we have, and I've done this, we have been just trying to get by. But we said, okay, 
Let's, what would it look like to not just get by? Let's look at the resources that we have, and we still have holes, but what if we all collected up our adult talent and said, okay, instead of providing four experiences, what if we all went to work on just one? Well, we took that to heart, and we said, you know, Jesus is without question, unmistakably, the centerpiece of life. And we sat and we said, all right, let's deliver one thing that we can broadcast over the internet, that you can invite your friends to, that you can be proud to show people who do not believe these things because you think it'll make an impact. What would it look like to do that? So beginning August 30th, we're going to do a series called Because, and we're going to talk about why we worship Jesus. Why do we worship Jesus? And we're going to deliver it with as much excellence and passion as we can because we're going to assemble all of our adult groups. And, and if, you're, if you're watching online, you're going to see what's in the room. If you're watching in Henderson or West or East at a later service, you're going to watch on the screens. And we're going to deliver worship on the screens and we're going to deliver messages on the screens. But what's going to go on that screen is going to be the result of people getting together and assembling all of our resources and saying, let's do our very, very, very best for the greatest mission in the history of of life. That's the goal. And that's one of the changes you'll see. The second thing I learned is this. As I look at Jesus' life, and I was exploring around, and I uh, and was making my discoveries, I discovered this. We are in a battle. We're in a battle. So the first thing Jesus does when he, he goes out into his adult uh, ministry, and, and he gets baptized, and that's kind of his revealing, and then the story immediately adjusts. It says he goes out into the wilderness, wilderness to be tempted by the devil. That's what it says. And he's tempted by, the devil means adversary, or accuser, Satan, this idea. And then immediately he comes down from, his, from this experience of being 40 days and 40 nights, he's tempted by the devil, and then he goes on his, uh, his, his ministry and he teaches people, and he heals people, and he drives out demons. Now this, I've known this, I've seen this, but the more I kept seeing this kind of come up in Jesus' life, the more I was struck by Jesus, if he really is the centerpiece of all the world, if he really is the truth of who he says he is, then he had a worldview that included that there was this powerful personality that we do not see, but is very, very, very real, that is an adversary, that is an accuser. And not only that, to add insult to injury, he is followed by under personalities who are bent on the same exact thing. And Jesus saw his mission partly as being the deliverer of those things. And we don't appreciate that sometimes. I think we, we, we can all envision Jesus teaching. We can envision him standing on a hill and saying all these amazing things. We can, even, we can envision him, you know, laying hands on this 12-year-old girl and her fever leaves. He's got to place his hand on her head. It's a gentle, beautiful movie scene kind of thing. But I, I, I love this passage that we saw in Luke. It says in Luke chapter 4, he was in a synagogue, and there was a man who was possessed by a, a demon. And Jesus says, be quiet. Jesus said sternly, come out of him. And then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. Can you imagine that scene? We forget sometimes that Jesus was also an exorcist. You ever seen, I think there's a bumper sticker, or I think it's also a t-shirt or whatever else. My boss is a Jewish carpenter. That's kind of a thing people do. I want one that says, my boss is a Jewish exorcist. And this is what kind of, uh, you know, looks you would get. This is exactly what it was. Jesus, among his titles, was an exorcist. And why does that matter to all of us? Because the one who's in charge of all life, the centerpiece of all of life, that was his worldview. And he saw himself as the deliverer from those things. But he also lets everybody know who's following him that that's a part of the deal. We are in a universe until he comes and fixes all of it where we are resisted by our own nature. We're resisted by, by nature itself. Jesus doesn't attribute every bad thing to the devil. Not every disease he heals does he blame on evil. What he does is he heals some physically and others he drives out demons, but it's a part of his worldview. And what that means for you and I is we need to remember that especially those of us who are Christ followers, when we look around at each other, we need to picture each other in battle fatigues. You're familiar with army camouflage battle fatigues, you know, the, the helmet and the, and, and, and the stuff and the arms and everything else. 
We need to picture one another in battle fatigues, and we need to picture one another in battle fatigues in a forward area, which is military speak for proximity to combat, where there's real bullets flying around, and people really can and do get hurt. And there's an adversary that's a personality. A personality can make choices. A personality can make strategies. A personality can resist. A personality can choose to do certain things. And that's the reality that we live in because Jesus said that's the reality we live in. Now, we don't have to be afraid. We just need to be aware. But why that's so crucial to know is I'm convinced one of the reasons that churches lose ground or split up or have all kinds of hangups is because we forget that sometimes. You know, there's a passage in the New Testament that says, if you're angry with your brother, if you're angry with somebody in the church and you let the sun go down, you just kind of go to sleep and you finish out the day by being angry at someone, it gives, and this is the quote, the devil a foothold. It actually, it, it gives him some place to, to get inside your life that he did not have before. And we need to be aware of that. That as we charge into battle, as we do this mission, that if this thing is true, it's the single most important mission in all of life, that we're all wearing battle fatigues and we're all in a forward area and bullets are being used and they're hurting one another. And so with that in mind, let's kind of cut each other some slack. The New Testament says repeatedly, forgive one another, forgive one another, forgive one another. You know the reason it says that so much? Because you get your opportunity to do it. That's why. Because we are going to offend one another. We're going to bother one another. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get on one another's nerves, and we're going to make one another angry. But the forgiveness needs to happen because it says that that, that foothold can be taken advantage of by the enemy himself. We're in a battle. We really are. And again, we don't have to be afraid, but we do need to be aware and as we go forward on the mission, let's keep that in mind. Let me give you one more thing that I wanted to lock down. It was kind of in my own journey of discovery as I've been looking at the gospel and kind of really trying to process it. It's this. Jesus healed, restored, and developed people. Jesus healed, restored, and developed people. As you watch Jesus go throughout his life, and he's the author, he's the perfecter, he's the pioneer of our faith. What did he do? How did he spend his time? Well, it's so cool that, it, that uh, Matthew and, and Mark actually say this. I cheated a little bit. Luke doesn't mention this, but there is an occasion where Jesus says he looked at the crowds and he saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd. In other words, they were going through things where they didn't know up from down. They didn't know what was, what was going on in life at all. And they were kind of lost. And he taught them out of compassion. He gave them direction out of his compassion for that. Jesus did that. We see him giving perspective. Okay, I, I've, I've admitted many, many times, I don't like to fly. I don't, I don't enjoy it. And especially when you're flying through a storm, which I've done a number of times. And, 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 but if you've ever had that, that experience where you're flying and you, you go up and, it, and it's dark and it's gray and it's raining and there's, there's, there's rain going on in the wings. And then you go up and all you see out the window is gray and you hear some thunder or something like that. And you're getting turbulence and you're just kind of, you're white knuckling real bad, or at least I am. And, and there's, but the cool thing that I do like about flying is when you're, when you're on the takeoff and you have that kind of experience, you break up up over the clouds and it's blue up there and you look down on the storm and I don't know if you've ever had that experience or not but sometimes you can fly and you can actually watch storms from a completely other perspective and Jesus being the centerpiece of all of life what he would do is he would have compassion on people there is a way when we fix our eyes on Jesus that he knew that even when storms are going on, it doesn't mean that the storm is not happening, but what he can do for us is he can give us a completely different perspective. Jesus taught the crowds out of compassion. What we've also watched in the book of Luke, and my personal favorite moment that we've seen so far, is where friends tear a hole in a guy's roof, and they have a friend who's paralyzed, and they lower him down in front of Jesus. They disrupt everything, and, he, and the paralytic is laying there in front of Jesus. And what the text says, Luke says, Jesus looked at him, and he said the word friend. Friend, your sins are forgiven. Friend, your sins are forgiven. 
And what I love about that is it puts the whole thing in perspective. It really shows where Jesus is coming from. He ends up healing the guy of his paralysis, but he gives him the greater miracle before that. And guys, that's our mission. That's what we're announcing. Hey, everybody, in the chaos of the world, you can fix your eyes on Jesus. You can rise above the clouds and above the storm. But not only that, you can have your sins forgiven. There's mistakes that you just regret so deeply that you grit your teeth. Those things that hurt you that you always feel chained for, you can have the Lord of all the universe say, hey, friend, your sins are forgiven. He healed people, but he restored people that way, psychologically and otherwise. Then we see him developing people. We saw the calling of the disciples. And and Peter, he he asked Peter to do something, and and Peter does it, and Peter doesn't really want to do it and thinks it's a dumb idea. But then then he catches all these fish, and and then Peter reacts by going, oh, my goodness, I know who you are, my Lord, my God. Depart from me. I'm a sinful man and all this sort of thing. And we watch him call this group of people around him. And the best thing about these people is they're kind of bumbling and fumbling throughout the story. They're just like us. There are people that don't get it right. There are people that, Jesus asked me to do this, but I think it's kind of a dumb idea, but I'm going to do it anyway. But now, I, depart from me, I'm a, I'm a sinful man kind of stuff. You know what's cool about those guys, like Peter and all them? Some of them were actually follower, followers of John the Baptist, so they were already religious people. And Jesus, they had been kind of pre-prepared, and Jesus called them. But as far as calling people, my favorite story was the calling of Levi, where he called someone that you're not supposed to call. He called someone that the religious people had pushed away. Jesus did that. That's who he is. That's what he's about. And that's what he does. And we need to remember that. That's the Jesus I knew existed before, but at the same time, I didn't appreciate it quite on the level that I do now. And I know what got me into this to start with. I was one of those that was kind of a mix between someone who had been prepared in church, but at the same time, if you would have met me years ago, you would have thought I was in that outside group of kind of like Levi, that I hung around a lot of people like Levi. The kind of person you're not supposed to call, that you're not supposed to mess with. That's why I'm so passionate about reaching out to people who aren't supposed to be in religious circles. Because that was me and that was my buddies. And I watched a lot of them come and be changed. As we go forward, as we're doing the changes that you'll see on August 30th, and we want to give you something that you can invite your friends to, a term that you're going to hear us say a lot, just as an explanatory term, is watch party. We know some of you can't come to the building. You're there in your living rooms, and that's okay. But we have people who are inviting neighbors and friends over to their living rooms to do a watch party, just so they can can be a part of the connection of everything. And they can consider the claims of the centerpiece of history. And we're going to, let's stress doing that. We're going to make our services on demand because I, I want to have watch parties. I got people in my mind that I know probably wouldn't come to a Sunday service, but they would probably come to my house on a Thursday night. Or even yet, we want to set it up where we can do that virtually. And if you're afraid to have people come over to your house because of COVID concerns or whatever else, you can invite someone to a watch party on Facebook. And you can take in the service together and then have a discussion about this whole statement that Jesus gives. It says... He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Is it true or is it not? If I struggle with it, how can you help me? In other words, we're going to get back in the business of doing our mission. And I want to invite us all to it. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the discovery of who you are. Thank you because of who who you are, we get to be what you've allowed us to be. In other words, we can follow you and we can be forgiving and we can bumble and stumble like the early disciples but not be thrown out or rejected by you. We can be developed by you. I ask you in Jesus' name that you will please help us to be that people on mission together and we'll take seriously the fact that you are the centerpiece of all the universe and of all of life. And we'll proclaim that with boldness and invite people in. I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.